Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, I'm Matt, and I'll be doing uh, this workshop. We are going to be talking about weighing. So, um, the, we're going to try and have this be relatively interactive. I'll be asking you questions, getting you to prep uh, different things. So, please do uh, unmute, get involved. If you've got questions at any point about anything I say, stick up your hand, use the raise hand button or um, unmute and ask or type it in chat. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at weight. So here's a very simple sort of primer for what we're discussing. Here's the motion. This house would ban single use plastics. And two arguments we've got. Proposition. Banning single-use plastics would be good for the environment. This is because these plastics are wasteful and require lots of energy and non-renewable resources to be made. Saving the environment is important. Opposition say, single-use plastics are extremely useful in medical situations. We need to use them to make things like gloves for doctors. Doctors need gloves to protect their patients from disease, Reducing the spread of disease is important. So, from a superficial reading, question is, who, if either, is correct? Are proposition right that this would be good for the environment and that the environment is important? Are opposition right that this would be bad for the medical profession and that their work is also important? Who's right? Op is wrong, prop is right. Okay. I think they I think they both are right. I'm not sure if uh, uh, these kinds of plastic are used in gloves, but uh, I think they may be. It may be. Well, both haven't compared uh, their cases to each other, but the scale of uh, what prop says is much bigger. Yeah, it's much bigger, but they're both right. Yeah. Okay, so I think you're you're both potentially correct here. Neither side has given us any way. I think at face value, both of these statements are clearly correct. It is clearly true that this would be good for the environment, and it's also true that this might be damaging for the medical industry. I think what you were saying, uh, Andre, is that. Uh, the scale of harm seems to suggest that prop is more right. Now that may well be true, but they haven't told us that yet. And so this is the sort of the whole point of weighing in general is that very often in debates, both sides will be correct about the thing that they are saying. They not, might not be correct to the same extent, but usually if the debate has a good motion, there will be sensible, correct arguments on both sides. And so what that gives us is a bit of a problem because it's, it's, it's easy enough to rebut an argument when someone says something that is just untrue. Well, we know that their argument is factually wrong or logically wrong, and we can rebut and say, your argument is wrong for reasons A, B, and C. But sometimes people make arguments that aren't wrong. There is no glaring flaw in the logic of the proposition argument here. It is true that single-use plastics are bad for the environment. That is uh, pretty much just a fact. So the question is, how do you deal with an argument that you know to be correct? And that's what we're looking at today. How do we weigh and beat arguments that we think on some level there is a degree of truth? So uh, this is the whole point. We're just trying to explain to judges why my arguments are more important than the other side's arguments. And there are a lot of different ways of doing this. And so what we're going to be doing today is going through a bunch of different sort of methods and examples for how we can compare. Um, when you do your weighing, you can do your rebuttal, your weighing in your rebuttal. You can also do it in the sort of constructive part of your speech. And of all speakers, weighing is most important in the whip speech, because of course you're explaining why your team, and in particular your sort of closing half, won. 
but obviously all speakers should be doing weighing. And although there are lots of different methods of weighing, the core principle is the same. My argument is more important than whatever their argument is. So if we turn back to this, um, let's take one or two minutes to work out for each side a piece of weighing. So if we were, imagine this is what the Prime Minister and the Leader of Op have said. Imagine you are the Deputy Prime Minister and the Deputy Leader of Op. What would you say as proposition to explain why this argument is more important than Op's argument? And vice versa. What would you explain if you were Op? To explain why your argument is more important than Prop's argument. I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to, to think of this, write something down, etc. But let's try and come up with two bits of way. One for Prop and one for Op. Okay, so let's start with Prop. Who's got some way that they think they can give to explain why Prop is beating Op here? Yep, go for it. Okay, so I would say that uh, the scale of the impact is greater, and I would explain that many people are actually using plastic, and it is gradually uh, being thrown out and uh, contained in our ground, soil, water, whatever, and then it poisons our crops, our uh, drinking water, and it hurts our health and uh, so on. And that is why, in the long run, we are facing more dramatic consequences. Okay, very good. So, explaining why uh, it's going to be a more severe impact. Anyone else got anything for prop? Yes, I think um, it can be a little bit hard to remove or avoid if you have a lot of plastics anywhere than uh, to just, I don't know, wash hands or make some altern alternatives to the doctors, to the doctor's gloves, yeah. Uh, okay, yes, this is good. So um, there are alternatives we can use for, for medicine. It doesn't have to be single-use plastics, but that is not the case for protecting the environment. Very good. Okay. Well, let's try some op way. Who thinks they could do the, the inverse and explain why this op argument is better? Uh, yeah, Keto, Keto, Keto. Okay. I can try if no one else. Yeah, I was just waiting to see. Is it, how do I say this? Keto, Keto? Keto? You've got your hand up. Oh, is it the, oh, it's the other side? Okay, sorry, that's me reading this wrong. Um, then I'm talking about Yana. Yana? Okay, never mind. Then go, Andre. Uh, we must understand one important thing. Even if government uh, shows us how to create alternative gloves without plastic we understand that it's still over cheap and when we talk about doctors who works in poor country it's very important to have a cheap med med medical equipment and other alternative will be overpriced and very hard to create and we understand that disease will come to us right now in short way uh, that's too important point yeah so maybe this is the only good way uh to meet um to 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 allow doctors and the medical profession to, to practice yeah uh that is sergey sergio yeah uh i think i got here two criteria uh, first of all it's uh, more risky yeah it's harmful uh, it's 
can be harmful right now. If you don't have gloves, they can, uh, I don't know, from some reasons you can't have alternatives. Yeah. Uh, it's risky because you can uh, uh, infect people right now and they can die right now. Yeah. But uh, if you are some, if, if you have uh, some, uh, I don't know, harm on, on the environment, it can be uh, some time in future. Yeah. And it can be, it can, can be the case that uh, those um, plastics aren't, uh, don't have the impact actually. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about certainty and short term versus long term. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first and the second is the uh, harm on the people right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, here. so um, yeah, it's, it's similar to certainty, right? Like we will, we will definitively harm a lot of people right now if we ban it. Um, maybe there is a benefit to people in the future, but that's sort of a bit more long term, a bit more, more, more distant. Yeah. Okay. Andre, I see you've got one. I, uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to say that, uh, uh, now we don't have other uh, material which will be so uh, elastic and so appropriate for medical purposes, uh, but uh, to protect environment and to uh, uh, make our atmosphere uh, less uh, wasted, we have alternatives. Well, firstly, we can use the counter probe, saying that uh, the banning is not the only option. We can uh, just force this reduce CO2 pollution, so stuff uh, like that. Uh, and uh, uh, secondly, we can use uh, some other methods, for example, as Trump proposes to plant uh, many trees and uh, trees uh, have the ability to clean up the air. Yes, yeah, so, but uh, now uh, at this moment, we don't have any other material which is so appropriate for Medicare. Yes, so. This is pretty much the only or best way we can do this medical stuff with op. However, there are other things we can do to help the environment. It's not clear a ban is necessary, simply a significant uh, reduction works. Yeah, so um, I'm sure some of you have got more to say. There are lots we can say, but I think you sort of broadly encompass these, and these are just ideas. There is no sort of correct way. There are lots of ways to weigh. But for prop, we could say, look, most medical plastics don't need to be single use. It can be replaced by reusable alternatives. The consequences of environmental damage will affect billions of people and should be weighed more highly. Op, we don't need to totally ban single use plastics to save the environment. A reduction will be sufficient. However, a total ban would make it extremely difficult to safely perform a wide variety of medical procedures, harming more people. So, Depending on which side we're on, we're going to try and push that that line of argumentation that their side, there are other ways we can fix their problem. Our side, we cannot. Both of those are, make perfect sense as pieces of way. So what we're going to do is we are going to run through a bunch of different ways we can weigh arguments. And the, the, the underlying principle with all of these is that you've got to find some kind of criterion or standard or metric that says, look, we're going to use some kind of neutral method of comparing two things. And then we're going to do the comparison. And lo and behold, my impact is the one that comes out on top. So part of what you've got to do when you're thinking about weighing is you've got to pick the best method of weighing one that will help you. So what are these different methods? And some of them are pretty simple. Some of them are a bit more complex. But the first one is the size of the impact. Essentially, my impact is more severe than your impact. So here we go. This house supports closing schools during pandemics. Offsets shouldn't close schools because children are going to have their education harmed. All right. What is the prop weighing response to this argument? Thinking about severity of impact. Anyone? 
what does proposition say in response to this argument? Op says, don't close schools because it will harm education of children. Can I say something? Yeah. Yeah, so we can say that we are trying to save their lives. What would they do with education if they're non-living? They're just dead. All right. So severity of the impact. If we keep schools open, mm -hmm. then more children are likely to suffer from whatever the disease is, exactly. have serious health effects. That is a bigger, more severe impact than any harm to their education, right? Uh, preventing children from going to school during the coronavirus outbreak may harm their education, but it will make it less likely they get the disease. Health is more important than education. We could also talk about other alternatives here, right? We could talk about, oh, we can do like sort of like some online learning. They can uh, learn a bit from home, blah, 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 blah. Um, we can say that this isn't going to completely destroy their education. Yes, it will harm it a bit. And that's always the key principle with weighing is acknowledging that the other team is a little bit right. Yes, no matter how good our alternatives may be, our Zoom or our Google Meets education may be, it is going to be worse, probably, for some, for some, for some children. But on balance, that harm is a smaller one than the risk of them getting disease or perhaps them spreading the disease to their family, even if they don't suffer from it that severely, etc. So that's our first potential weighing method. It's just thinking about, in very simple terms, which impact is actually bigger and a more severe impact on the same group of people. The second one, prevalence of impact. Uh, again, relatively simple. My impact affects more people than your impact. So again, simple schools example, this house would ban homework. Uh, marking takes up lots of teachers' time. What is the prop response to this? The op response, rather, to this argument. Can I say something? Yeah. Yeah, so the number of teachers compared to the number of students, students get more out uh, of knowing what's right and wrong in their homework than the number of teachers wasting their time. So the students are actually getting more out of it. And therefore, yeah. we, we think that we need homework for students. Yes, and also there are more students than there are exactly. teachers, generally. So... Uh, when you have, um, and this obviously applies in lots of other debates, often when we're talking about things like politics, economics, okay, maybe some people are, are, are harmed. And that's all, almost always the case in almost all motions about economics, usually. Some group of people gets made poorer, some other group of people gets made richer. What we've got to argue, therefore, is that the group of people that we are made richer, we care more about them. And one such method is arguing, well, there's a lot more of them. So, uh, yeah, in this case, it illustrates the point that, yes, okay, individual teachers have to spend a lot of time marking, and that's not very good for them, but uh, on balance, it is better for students' education. Okay, next one, likelihood, likelihood of impact. Um, my impact is more likely to happen than your impact. Now, this could be uh, a game of probabilities. It could also be because the other side has uh, not done a very good job with their analysis. So if they sort of say something will happen and give like one quite weak reason, and you say something else is going to happen, but have spent a lot of time really in depth analyzing why your argument is likely to happen, then probably you can use this as way. You can say, look, you know, may, maybe their thing does happen, but they've not really proven it's true, whereas we have. Another reason might just be at face value. Logically, you can claim yours is more likely. So here we go. This house would ban nuclear weapons. Proposition. 
if someone uses a nuclear weapon, the explosion could kill millions of people. So here they're trying to use the sort of prevalence and severity argument to say, look, this is going to affect a lot of people very severely. If a nuclear weapon goes off, this is really, really bad. Okay, thinking about likelihood, what is the opposition weighing response to this argument? I can try. Yep, yep. Uh, if you have nuclear weapon, it doesn't show 100% possibility that you will use this weapon because you will also harm by using this. The most important uh, benefits from nuclear weapon it's the way to control other country. It's like preventing each other. Everyone have a nuclear weapon and everyone understand that if someone of them will use, everyone will be suffer. So that's why when you have nuclear weapon, you will more likely not to use this weapon. You will more, more likely just to show that you have this weapon and uh, you have weapon to protect yourself. All right, exactly. So the idea here is like, yes, if you fire a nuclear weapon, that would potentially harm millions of people. But it is very unlikely that any country is ever actually going to use one. Instead, the benefit of deterrence is significantly more widespread. So yes, firing a nuke would be really, really bad. However, that is not going to happen. Instead, what's going to happen is the possession of nuclear weapons is what is what you said. If I have nuclear weapons, other countries are not going to invade or attack me because they know that I've got nuclear weapons. Uh, and if both sides have nuclear weapons, then no one is going to fight each other again because they don't want to start a nuclear war. So although the possible impact of a nuclear weapon exploding is very, very large, it's actually a very, very unlikely impact. And so we shouldn't ban nuclear weapons because they are useful for this. So, um, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a bit of a practice. So can I just check who is here and has microphones? Can you just like do the raise hand button if you have a microphone that works? One, two, three, four. How many people have we got? Um, okay, we've got most, we've got like six people who put their hand up. So that's a good start. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Um, who have we got? We've got two Andres, three Andres, I think. So let's have. The three Andre, if your name is Andre or something like that, you are proposition. The rest of you who've got your hand up can be opposition. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> proposition. Oh, there's a few more people. So, let's just have some prop people. So, the three Andres are prop. Um, everyone else is off. And this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to give you a motion. If you're prop, come up with two arguments. If you're op, come up with two arguments. Then we're going to um, go through these arguments one by one. You will give a prop argument. They will give an op argument. Then you will explain why your argument is better than theirs. Then they will do the opposite and explain why their argument is better than yours. Okay, so here's our first motion. This house would give extra votes to individuals who live in areas with consistently low turnout. And if you're not sure what turnout means, turnout is the overall percentage of people who come and vote. So basically, this is saying if you live in an area where not very many people vote in elections, we will give you extra votes. So um, let's take, say, five minutes to brainstorm, write down some arguments, OK? And then we're going to present them. Yeah. Do we need separate, uh, like, uh, 
meet rooms uh, to brainstorm. No, you can, you're just doing it on your own. Um, so we're doing it as individuals, but we just have a couple of people doing prop arguments, a couple of people doing off arguments. Come up with two arguments. arguments. Uh, question about them. We, we yes, talk yes. about areas where we have many people, but not, not much of them is voting on the ejection, ejections. Yes. Yes. Okay. Turnout is usually expressed as a percentage. So a turnout of, say, 20% means of all of the eligible voters, only 20% of them actually voted in the election. So I'll give you uh, five minutes or thereabouts. So at uh, whatever that would be, 35, we will go for it. Okay, so how are we doing? Are we good to go or do people want more time? I'm ready. Okay, so uh, can I get a volunteer, first of all, from Prop? Yeah, I can start. Okay, okay. perfect. And do we have a volunteer from Hop? Yes, I think. Okay, perfect. So you two, what we'll do, we'll get the prop argument first, then we will hear the op argument, and when you give your op argument, you can then also give the way. So explaining why your op argument is better than the prop argument, and then we'll go back to prop and give you a chance to sort of respond and give your way. Okay, so let's just hear one. I know you did two arguments. Just give me one argument first of all. So one prop argument, please. Okay, let's start. Uh, quickly about problem. We understand uh, if your areas don't give many votes, politics who can change uh, the quality of life in your areas just don't care about your areas because they just want to win ejection and they will spend more time to other areas. And many people saw, suffer because no one don't cares about them. We think the most important criteria of these debates is to create a world where at least half of people from area will vote in ejection. And our argument will tell this story. And when we give a triple vote power or more to areas when vote around 20 or 10 percent, we create a world where more people vote in long way how it works most politics uh after this idea more politics will watch to this place because they want a vote uh they will make more changes to these areas they will more promise and more people will see how this areas is changing most even if politic who has won will be better and worse this politic will care about this area and uh, will try to change something even if he will fail fully, people who disagree with ejection, after that, will start voting uh, on next and future ejections. And we think that it's most important and uh, fair idea that when you vote on the ejection, you represent your opinion. If you don't want, uh, you can say anything about quality of politic. And when amount of people goes to 50 percent of this low area this is their power of vote equal to other area that's all we represent all of areas and we show other people who don't want that they can change the area okay very good so let us hear the op argument and you can also give your op Weighing. So when you finish the argument, explain why your argument is better than the proper. So, uh, so we sh I shouldn't uh, uh, rebuttal here, yeah. Don't rebut. Weigh. Okay. 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 I get it. Okay. Um. So, uh, 
my argument is that people who are living in those area are uh, don't go to uh, uh, to voting because they have some reason yeah they can be not informed they can they can be not uh, not know to whom uh, they should wo vote they can uh, they can't uh, understand that uh, those pol uh, politicians don't uh, uh, change anything or they just don't want to be a part of this uh, corrupted uh, system or this uh, this political si system they they don't fo uh, follow it yeah uh, so um and the, uh, and the sec uh, second, uh, my second idea is that uh, this will uh, not work because there are, uh, there are people, uh, as I said, who don't want to go and who don't uh, follow this uh, stuff. And when you uh, and when you give them uh, more votes, we should uh, we should understand that there already are a bunch of people who are going and vote. Yeah, who uh, think that uh, this is important to uh, this. Um, Voting, uh, voting, voting system uh, is impo is important, yeah. Um, but there are also um, and, and they are going and they are voting right now, yeah. But another people who are uh, who are um, think, thinking that uh, uh, politics are, are important or uh, all those all those stuff, which I said uh, already, don't uh, don't voting, yeah. So they don't know, they don't have the information, they uh, don't have the properly good uh, choice. Yeah, they, uh, the people from, uh, they first of all, don't, uh, don't go, this, one, uh, this wouldn't uh, help, yeah? And the second, uh, second uh, one, if they um, don't know already what, uh, what is, um, uh, who, uh, which politician would uh, uh, represent themselves uh, in the better way, they can't uh, choose this uh, this politician. And uh, right now, and uh, most most of the politician will uh, came with a populist idea when they say we'll give you, uh, we will make your area the best in the world. Let's make your area great again, or uh, st uh, stuff like this. But they can't do this. Yeah. So. Uh, they will they will be cho chosen and they will uh, fail properly not only on on this area but on all area because uh, politicians are uh, chosen in the in all uh, country most uh, most of uh, mo uh, in the most parts yeah so uh, here we understand that this um, impact will be greater because uh, in the, their world they can be a, ch a change in the um, in on, only in one one area, uh, but in our uh, world, there there will be a change in the in all um, country, yeah, or in yeah in all country, let's say, yeah, and um, yeah, I think uh, this is the only uh, comparison. Okay, very good. Now, um, Andre, do you want to do counterway? Explain why actually your argument is better. Uh, I had some problem to understand English words, so for me it will be hard to make this work. Okay. Um, Sergey, could you, in say two sentences, summarize the main point of your argument? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my idea was that. Um, they will. Uh, they uh, will be a lot of uh, populists, which uh, will uh, take the power because the people aren't uh, so informed. People who are aren't voting right now aren't so informed. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense, Andre? Yeah, I understand. Uh, I will try. In compare, uh, we understand that people don't have enough information first of all because they just not interested in this information they don't see a connection how politics work, how they change it in our world m more possibility that they will see that in their area has one politic that promised great things and nothing has changed and after that they will be more interesting because people hate a moment when they get allied 
in status quo, they will not even interested about politics because they just don't don't say about this area. Every people just interested about their interested, and that that's why in our world, a possibility to change the level of education, political education, people will be higher. Okay, very good. Well done. So um, I think we're sort of comparing here severity of impact, which I think is a good way. I think these are both good arguments. Uh, do we have another volunteer who did a, a prop argument? Yes, I can okay. do it. So and another argument. Have, yes. yes. And let's just check. Do we have another volunteer who did an op argument? Yes, I can try. Okay, perfect. So let's do another pair. So let's have the prop. We'll do the same thing. So prop argument, then op argument and weighing, and then back to prop for prop weighing. So let's go with the, the prop argument. Uh, okay, the metric chosen by opposition is supposed to be that uh, everybody is better when we are not concentrated on uh, this minority of regions, but we're going to take them on their best and prove that uh, everybody and uh, everyone from uh, every region, regardless it's overpopulated or underpopulated, he, sh he or she would be much better when the development of regions uh, is more equalized and more fair as we uh, convinced uh, so uh, we think that even people from overpopulated uh, regions uh, are suffering from this inequality uh, three reasons why is that uh, firstly because of criminality in those uh, other regions and uh, criminals uh, who are coming from there uh, two reasons why it's so uh, firstly because of low level of education so uh, be because schools are not so well funded uh, there uh, and uh, you don't have a value not to commit a crime yes and b because there is no other way to earn money uh, not committing crimes not joining criminal band gangs or uh, some stuff like that and these people commit uh, crimes uh, from these underpopulated regions against all the humanity against all the society in other regions and so on and so forth uh, the second thing we in some school we have limited amount of workplaces yeah and even in overpopulated regions enterprises have automated their production and we have low number of workplaces but when uh, politicians as uh, previous speaker prop speaker said have an incentive to fund these regions to give them subsidies to build infrastructures such as bridges uh, such as roads uh, which uh, makes investitions to these regions more attractive yeah uh, we have they have uh, we have another alternative and we can, for, for example, go to these underpopulated regions and uh, occupy some workplace, workplace there. But th third uh, problem, we don't even have uh, workplaces in our own uh, overpopulated regions because uh, people uh, who live in areas with consistently love to now they don't have workplaces there and they become scapers uh, and labor migrants who come to the overpopulated regions and take away someone's workplace and uh, we have a lot of people fired because of that and we think when uh, when these people have uh, lower incentives to to come to other regions and take away their workplaces uh, we have uh, less regional conflicts uh, and conflicts with uh, migrants in overpopulated regions and we are to say that the, when uh, the development of regions is more equalized is better for everyone in this country uh, because we have uh, less conflicts and more goods to share very good so let's get the op argument Okay, so now let's think about this. We are speaking about a country that has the luxury of democracy and has an area where the majority chooses to stay silent and just ignore this luxury. So here I would like to think that this majority has is facing one of two either they are way too spoiled to understand the luxury of having the power, their voices actually heard and their voices actually making a difference or they are undereducated and they don't understand the importance and the impact of their voices now what the government would do by giving just so more um, value to uh, to the votes of the minority 
is that it would ignore the importance of either educating the uneducated people in this area about the importance of this white or telling the spoiled people that you will not be that spoiled on the long run if you keep ignoring the, your voice. Now, why is it important to make this clear for the majority? Because those majorities, they have kids and they're teaching this to generations. If they don't build the culture within them and give it to their kids and their, from kids to grandkids to teach them the importance and the way of their uh, voices being heard then what's going to happen is after a couple of generations you will go back to a country where people simply or even at least this area the whole area or maybe even on a bigger scale the whole country no one would be voting because simply people don't see why do you need it or don't understand why they need it or they think like oh everything is just too perfect why should i waste my time on trying to uh, vote and choose who's going to be in power so uh yes so the idea of keeping the culture as for uh weighing uh, i'm really Really sorry from uh, for proposition i'm not really sure um, maybe i misunderstood you but i'm not really um sure about the idea of over overpopulation and underpopulation how is it related so if you could just summarize your argument i'm really sorry i didn't get it i uh, yeah i can summarize yes, uh, so uh people from other uh, regions suffer uh because of lack of development in this uh, underpopulated areas with consistently low turnout because of uh, labor migrants and criminals coming from there. And would how would giving extra votes help? To so the, when we give these people extra votes, the situation uh -huh. in their own regions is, is uh, better and they don't need to become criminals uh, or become labor migrants. Oh, okay. I get what you mean. Okay, kind of. Okay, so um, you're speaking more about right now. So yes, it might uh, solve the problem at the moment because people would give more way or importance to this small area if we say it's a small area. But then at the same time, on the long run, the number of people that are voting will keep decreasing and then the number and the way of their voting will keep increasing. And uh, therefore, just ignoring this was not going to solve the problem on the long run you will keep doing the same thing until after some time there will simply be no votes at all coming from this area so it will not solve the main problem it will just push it over okay you want to give some prop weighing back to this uh, okay uh, so uh, offside has uh, given us an argument that these people will be uh, frustrated and th they will not ha ha have a need uh, in voting but we think it's not so pl plausible because uh, they see no result in elections now because politicians have no need uh, to hear them uh, to care after them uh, and they have an understanding even in case i vote nobody uh, will heed my words uh, nobody will perceive it seriously uh, th that is to say uh, we follow the offside criterion more uh, explaining how uh, they so votes are going to be taken into account and how it's going to change the situation and uh, having this uh, understanding that uh, that I can affect changes and I can demand for something and politicians will uh, heed my words. Uh, I will be more motivated to vote more and more and tell my kids that uh, you can and you uh, can affect uh, the situation in your country, in your regions uh, and the future of your children. Very good. Okay. Do we have any more volunteers who want to give uh, points? No. Okay. So, uh, well done, everyone. I think that was a uh, really good uh, couple of sort of mini debates. I think we sort of hit upon the key areas here which is that this debate is clearly going to be about um, how do we actually benefit uh, the people who live in these areas. I think we sort of hit upon the idea that probably if you're in an area with low turnout, you're likely to not have loads of representation. The question is, is this a meaningful fix or is this just a sort of short term sticking plaster that doesn't actually fix the underlying problems and may even cause greater problems down the line? 
Okay, so this is what I suggest we do because we're, we're about halfway. Let's uh, take a five minute break um, and then uh, we will carry on with some more weighing methods. So five minutes and we'll start again at on the hour, basically. Okay, so five minute break and then we'll resume. Okay, so let's uh, carry on. Now, we were talking before about some weighing methods. Let's add on a few more. So, first, exclusivity of impact. So, there are other ways to get your impact. These other ways do not result in the same harms. So, thinking about banning nuclear weapons, one argument we've already talked about in this debate, nuclear weapons are a powerful deterrent to conflict. Are there other ways we could get this same impact? What could props say in response to this argument? I think that there, there are a lot of things that are powerful deterrent to conflict. They can be economic uh, stuff, they can be, I don't know, some... Um, Yeah, I don't know. Let's say this is the only one. The economic uh, deterrent can be also. Yes. So you're you're on the right lines, right? Which is that there are other ways we can deter conflict. Now, powerful. Uh, we can use uh, economic deterrents. We could also just use a large conventional military, take away the nuclear weapons. No one is attacking the USA or Russia, China, etc. anyway, just because their regular non-nuclear military is far too large and too powerful. Uh, yes, I see a hand. We must understand uh, two types of conflicts. Uh, nuclear weapon is stops a physical conflict between Russia and the USA. But we still have ideologic uh, conflict uh, when we talk about Cold War. And we think that more important to prevent conflict ide ideology, uh, conflict when people don't hate each other. If you, you and you have nuclear weapon, you still hate each other, but you just don't use nuclear weapon. And you will use alternative way to harm each other, not to destroy the world. Ah, OK, so we can argue that this actually is a relatively incomplete deterrent. It only affects certain parts of conflict and not others, and so it's not good. Yeah, that would be a decent response. Um, so, um, yeah, I think a combination of these things. So um, there are other ways we can dissuade or deter conflict, such as large conventional militaries or economic uh, reasons. But... And there's always got to be a but. Whenever you make this argument, if you're just saying, look, there are other ways to get that harm, that's not enough. Yes, there are other ways to deter. Okay, that doesn't mean that this is a bad thing. Okay, in debating, it's always about comparisons. Things aren't bad, they are worse. Things aren't good, they are better than whatever it is the other side is saying. So, in this case, if I am going to make the claim that there are other ways I can uh, deter conflict. It's important that I show that these other ways are also better for some reason. And that reason is going to be that there are some harms to nuclear deterrents that these methods don't have. So an example is given on the slide. Um, the risk of, for example, a terrorist organization getting hold of a nuclear weapon and causing damage is uh, a severe risk. 
if a terrorist gets hold of a single tank or fighter jet or something, uh, probably not going to be able to do as much damage with it. So uh, the risk is too high. The benefits can be achieved in other less risky ways is the key point here. Yes. Uh, I have an idea, I don't know how it will be work, but it continues about uh, ideology war. Uh, some people can use nuclear weapon uh, because this may ideological uh, arguments, not, not because this can harm your own country. I, I mean that uh, some country, like maybe North Korea or USSR, uh, can use nuclear weapon because they have feeling of global saving world, global, global idea, and they don't care about will they survive or not. They believe that they brave and have idea. How possible to prove this idea in debates that shows that even I'll understand that everyone will die by using nuclear weapon, some country can use this by ideological ideas. Yeah. yeah. So I've heard this argument once or twice before. I think what you have to argue is that deep down, however they present themselves, you know, North Korea is fundamentally rational. Kim, Kim Jong-il is fundamentally a, uh, Kim Jong-un rather, is fundamentally a rational guy in that what he wants is North Korea, or maybe not even North Korea, maybe it's just him himself and his family, but he wants himself, his family, or North Korea more generally to stand as a bastion of his own ideology. And if he starts a nuclear war with someone, with America, for example, and loses, uh, then everything that they have worked to build will be destroyed. And there is no reason to do that, right? It's not like there's any threat of America attacking North Korea right now. So they're better off not doing it. So I think your argument makes sense. But what you'd have to do is you'd have to prove that what you said, you'd have to prove that there are some countries who don't care about the consequences. I think that's hard to do. I think it's easy for the other side to say, maybe they don't care about the consequences to their own citizens, right? Maybe they don't care if a couple hundred thousand North Koreans die, but they do care if they individually die or they individually lose power. And those are things that are very likely to happen. So uh, there is certainly countries are not um, crazy enough to start a nuclear war. It would have to be someone who doesn't have that risk of strike. So, for example, if a random uh, member of ISIS got their hands on a nuclear weapon and used it, against, I don't know, Germany or some European country, where do you strike back if you're Germany? Um, you know, you're not attacking a country, you're attacking a, a group that's disparate and spread out in lots of places. So it would have to be someone who either genuinely has nothing to lose because they so completely believe in their cause, which I think might be true of some terrorist groups, but probably isn't true of any country. Or it's got to be someone who there is no uh, vulnerability to being hit back with a nuclear weapon. Russia can't ever fire a nuclear weapon at anyone because there are, there are too many targets, right? You just fire a nuclear weapon right back. Same with the USA, the UK. Um, all of their big cities are just big targets. Whereas if I am a small terrorist organization, there is no target for anyone to shoot at. So... Your argument can work, but I think it will be a difficult one to to win on because you have to prove that these countries are willing more, they care more about their ideology and making a point than they do about potentially millions of their own citizens dying. Make sense? 
Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. So, exclusivity of impact. Um, another way of arguing is the idea that we might have in our motion a special duty or responsibility to some particular stakeholder. Have you guys come across this term stakeholders before? Yes. Yeah. We call them yeah. actors mostly. Yeah. So basically a stakeholder is any group that is in some way relevant to the motion is affected by the motion. And what we might want to argue is that even though maybe the group isn't very big, or maybe that group isn't affected that much, um, this is a group that we care more about than other groups within the motion. Because again, most motions have different effects on different groups of people. There's no one universal effect that happens to everyone. So if there's a special duty to a stakeholder and it's good or bad, the, the effect on the motion, then that means we should or should not do it. So for example, and this is a really obvious one to make the point, this house as the feminist movement supports quotas for women in CEO and board level positions. Op says, this reduces the opportunities for men who might be better qualified than women to take these positions and is in some way unfair as a result. What is the proposition weighing response to this argument? Oh, can I? Yeah. Um, so, uh, proposition can uh, answer to this opposition argument with the following that um, even though there could be some men who may be better qualified than women, there are still some women that could uh, be unable to use this opportunity just because of their gender, which is uh, very unfair and bad for the democracy. Okay, yeah, that's a good piece of rebuttal. But can, can anyone think of anything that works thinking about special duties? So I think what you show there in that response is that, yes, there might be some harms to some men, but there are also lots of harms to some women. The question is, well, why do we care more about the harms to the women than we do to the men? And I think there is yeah. a couple of answers. Go on. Yeah, I think uh, we can say that uh, as a feminist uh, movement, we should care about the woman, about uh, the about their rights, and about their uh, development as a specialist or as a person or as a, no matter why, and uh, in this case, we shouldn't care about the man as long as the opposition don't uh, say how those men are uh, impacting the feminist mo movement. Yeah. Yes. So. This is an act emotion, and we are the feminist movement. So if we're the feminist movement, our job is to help women. It's to emancipate and give more rights to women, rather than thinking about everyone, okay? So uh, our job is to help women achieve equality and success. The harms of this policy to men are therefore less important than the benefits to women. And you see, the, the thing we're doing here is we're not saying that men are harmed less than women or women are harmed more than men. We're not actually trying to do a way up of who is harmed or benefited more. We're just saying, look, we are the feminist movement. Our job is to help women. So if some men get harmed in the process, that's fine because we care more about benefiting women. That's a response. OK, yes. Andre. Uh, we can also use statistics to show that in cell position, around two or three percent of women versus 97. And if the men will lose five, ten percent, and this don't create much benefit that is harms men's position on company. We understand that even we as feminist movement interested that men will also support us and continue argument ar argument like a representation all genders and CEOs will 
create company better and cool and other benefits when in rural position works two genders. Yes, yes, um, that's a really good uh, piece of wing because what we say is, and I think it's really good, you, you introduce this extra sort of fact by saying, look, the, you know, there's only a couple of percent of CEOs um, are women. And so particularly of like a large prominent com uh, companies, um, if we make a bunch of them women, sure, some men lose out, okay? some individual men and some individual women succeed but the benefit here isn't just to the the individual woman who now just becomes the ceo the benefit here is much more widespread we can use our prevalence of impact to say okay men used to hold 97 percent of board positions now they hold 90 percent of board positions does this hold back men as a as an entire gender from success in the business world not really it's not a big impact to go from 97% to 90%. But for women to go from 3% to 10%, over tripling the amount of representation you have as, as CEOs, this is actually really good. This is a really big benefit for representation. It's a benefit because, you know, these people might make more policies that help other women succeed, blah, 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 blah. So you see, we make a bunch of arguments that essentially say the the scale of harm actually is is on our favor it's only a minor harm to a couple of individual men who don't get their promotion but this is a benefit to basically all women who participate in business and therefore the benefit is much greater than the harm um the reason this is important to, to think about as a concept is because when we talk about special duty to particular stakeholders, it might be because in this case, we're in actor motion, right? And so obviously, if we are the feminist movement, we care about women more. If this motion was this house as China would, I don't know, withdraw from somewhere, the South China Sea, then our special duty of the stakeholder is in particular to China, the security of China, the Chinese population, okay? Um, if I do a motion, this house as Biden would, I don't know, do something, then my special duty is to Biden. Maybe I have a special duty to the American public, to Democrat voting American public. But Actor motions aren't the only types of motions that can create special duties. If I have a debate about welfare policy, um, we I did a motion in my last session that was something like, um, we should um, uh, build social housing in poorer areas. Probably, oh, sorry, in wealthy areas. Probably our special duty here is to the poorer members of society who will need to live in this social housing, okay? If OP says, look, this will be bad for... So the, the motion is basically build social housing in wealthy neighbourhoods. OP might say, we shouldn't do this because it will lower the property value of houses in these neighbourhoods and so the wealthy people who currently live there will have their property prices uh, decreased. What is a weighing response to that argument? So the motion, we should build uh, sort of government housing in wealthy neighborhoods, the opposition says, we shouldn't do this because it will devalue house prices and property prices in these neighborhoods. And that is bad for the wealthy people who currently live there. Thinking about what we just talked about in terms of special duties and stakeholders, how might we respond to this argument? You mean, okay, do. 
Okay, thanks. So uh, the state has failed to provide uh, uh, its citizens in poor areas with normal living conditions. Uh, thus, we have a special duty in front of them uh, and uh, uh, we are supposed to create special conditions uh, only for them, not for those uh, who were lucky enough uh, to uh, live uh, in luxury areas. All right. Exactly, very good. So we have a special duty to help those people who the government has already failed. The reason these people need social housing is sort of the government has failed them, maybe we haven't provided them with good education, we haven't provided them with good job opportunities, whatever it might be. We have a responsibility to help those people. If the cost of helping those people is we do a little bit of economic damage to people who are already very fortunate and have benefited greatly from society, that is a good trade that we are perfectly willing to make. Yeah, very good. Okay, so some people in debates matter more than others, depending on what the debate is. And we can spend a bit of time arguing that this will affect a certain group of people in a certain way. And that group of people is particularly important for some reason. And that's another good way to do way. Okay, one more way. Short term versus long term. Your impact is good in the short term, but in the long term, mine is better. This house believes developing countries should prioritize economic growth over good environmental policy. Prop says. By developing the economy, we will make people richer and improve their lives. What do ops say in response to this argument, thinking about short term and long term? I think as uh, opposition, we might say that uh, there will be very bad environmental uh, i don't know this uh, this uh, uh, economic development would uh, harm uh, environment yeah so uh, right now we can take um, more money or more more uh, goods but in long term this will be very harmful for uh, uh, environment and environment is important for us because uh, I don't know why. Yeah. yeah, so long term more harms. Andre, did you want to say one? Uh, I understand that policy not means police, it's like policy. What means word environmental to fully understand FM? Uh, environmental policy is stuff trying to check the environment, be eco-friendly. So that would be things like more renewable energy, recycling, electric cars, lower pollution, that sort of thing. I don't know the 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 the, the Russian word for this. No, это все что все все что все что связано с защитой окружающей среды. Okay, I understood. Because I created other case about what well, I should protect. It's not about this thing. I will think more. Okay, no worries. Uh, yep. Yeah. Other hand. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, how can we impact short term over long term? Um, if you want to do it the other way around, so say short term is more important. Y yeah, I mean, what is a general piece of advice for that? Um, so I think that it depends which way you want to argue normally. So in this case, if we're arguing that this is, uh, better in the long term, the idea here is that the long term is more permanent. It affects more people for a longer period of time. So if everyone is rich for, you know, five, 10 years, but after that we destroy the environment, people lose their jobs, um, and they get poorer, they probably get poorer for a very long time. And it's harder for us to fix is the idea here. If you want to do it the other way around and say that short term is more important, 
I think the way I would do it would be to argue about certainty. So what I'd say here is, look, if we get a good economic policy in the short term, in the immediate future, we will make people's lives materially better. Maybe, maybe there will be some environmental consequences to this, but we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in a hundred years time. We don't know if we will develop a bunch of uh, good bits of science that, that help us with this problem. Maybe an asteroid will hit the earth. Maybe there will be another pandemic and we'll all die or there will be, you know, World War Three. We have no idea what's going to happen in a hundred years time. But what we do know is that if we do this policy right here and right now, we will alleviate a huge amount of suffering. So you can do the certainty likelihood by saying, their harms of like, what if this is really bad for the environment in 50 years time is based on a, a, a guess, a prediction, which isn't very certain. So all we can do is we can benefit the people who are alive and living today. And you can get into much more complicated philosophy about like what obligations, if any, we have to people who might live in the future look, these people don't exist. We have no reason to believe they will exist. Um, I have no particular moral duty to help people who might live in the future. Certainly, if I do, it is lesser than my obligation to help people who are definitively living today. Uh, those sorts of arguments. Or, in this debate, you could try and be sneaky and say, look, if in the short term, we develop economically, that means then in the future, once we are well developed, we can start making good environmental policy decisions. So once we've built a robust, strong economy, then we can start doing things like being a bit greener and recycling more and polluting less. But we've got to reach a stage where we're economically secure first before we take the hit. That's probably how I would argue the short-term stuff. Thanks. It was useful. Okay, cool. Yes, other question. Uh, I had an idea that shows that people who will live better and richer, it's not equal. Uh, argument about idea that people who live in central city will live good in short term and in long term but but facilities which is provides economic boost will be placed on other place of country then people who live around facilities will suffer every time and show that people who one people will be happy every time other people will harm every time definition people Okay. Yeah, um, I think that makes sense. So, um, this is what we'll do. Um, oh, sorry. One or two last things, then we'll do one final practice. So, one common, one good tip with Wayne is to use this. I'm sure you've come across it before. Even if, the even if argument. Now, before you weigh an argument, it's always a good idea to try and rebut it first. And then you use an even if. So here's the idea of the even if. You make an argument that says thing A is true and that is bad. Your rebuttal goes like this. Actually, thing A is not true for this reason. Now, if the judge believes your rebuttal, you're doing very well. The judge goes, well, all of their arguments about thing A don't count anymore because this team has successfully shown that thing A doesn't happen. What you then do is you give yourself a backup. You say, but even if thing A is true, it's still less important than my argument for some other reason. The key point here is that this is a two-pronged attack. You say, 
your argument is wrong. But actually, even if your argument was right, it's still irrelevant, less important than my argument. This only works if your even if does actually assume their argument is true. Okay? So, example, this house would ban homework. Marking homework takes up a lot of teachers' time. Okay, so teachers mark homework outside of class hours and are paid. This is part of their job. So we're rebutting them and saying it's not a harm. But even if this is a big hassle to teachers, we think it is more important that students are able to use homework to learn. There are a lot more students than teachers and that education is more important than a minor inconvenience to teachers. So we're rebutting it two different ways. First way, we're just like, look, it's not actually a big deal. This is literally just teacher's job. Yes, they mark homework, they're supposed to, they're paid for it, not a problem. But if it is a problem, so now we're flipping, and we're saying, okay, maybe you're right, a bit right. You still don't matter. So even if it's a really good tactic, so whenever you're rebutting, try and do this. Give two bits of rebuttal that are different. If you give two bits of rebuttal that are basically the same, or you only, you say, for example, teachers uh, mark homework outside of class hours and are paid accordingly, so it's part of their job. Therefore, this is less important because they get paid anyway. Our weighing only makes sense if I believe the rebuttal first. If I don't believe the rebuttal, or the other team then comes back and rebuts it, uh, rebuts the rebuttal, and I think actually teachers are not paid for this, then the weighing doesn't work anymore. So the idea, think about it like a sort of like a like a like a card, you know, like if you make a pyramid out of playing cards. You want to make two different pyramids, not one big pyramid. If you make two, one big pyramid, then they only have to take out part of it and the whole thing falls down. Whereas if I've got my rebuttal, your argument is not true. Judges could believe that. And if the judge believes the argument isn't true, then I win. Maybe the judge doesn't believe my rebuttal and thinks, no, 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 I think the argument is still true. Well, then I've got my weighing that says, even if the argument's true, actually it doesn't matter that much, then I can convince the judge that way. So, two-pronged attack. Your argument's wrong, but even if your argument isn't wrong, it still doesn't matter. And so it's important when you do your even ifs to make sure that you are playing fair and you are going, okay, even if you are true, then you are weighing the true version of the argument. Any questions about even ifs? No, okay, cool. So, last thing. So, how do we weigh some final tips? First of all, always do the strongest arguments. So whatever you think their best argument is, weigh that. Don't bother so much with attacking each and every little thing they say, and don't bother with weighing off their really rubbish arguments, their small arguments. Go after their big headlines. Weigh their strongest arguments. Weigh them against your strongest arguments. Also, use multiple weighing methods. Say, look, this doesn't affect that many people. Also, it doesn't affect them that much. And the people it does affect are not as important as this other group we have a special duty to. So use lots of weighing methods. Again, it's like with the even ifs. The more different methods you use, you only need the judge to believe one of them to think that you've beaten their argument. And then of course, do your even ifs, rebut their argument, and then weigh it for a double effect. Their argument's wrong for this reason, but even if it is correct, it's still less important because of some other reason. Okay, so let's do one more practice. Any questions before we go for that?
Look, okay, so practice number two. Um, let's get some, uh, tell you what we'll do. If you did proposition for the last exercise we did, you're now opposition. If you did opposition in the last exercise, you're now proposition. So we'll just swap the sides, okay? So if you were op last time, now you're prop. If you were prop last time, now you're op. So, same broad principle. I want you to come up with two arguments for your side of the motion. We'll then take it in turns with a prop argument, an op argument, and some way. And this is the motion. This house believes that the state should pay a salary to stay-at-home parents. This house believes that the state should pay a salary to stay-at-home parents. Okay. So, do I have a volunteer for prop to give an argument? Yes, I can try. Okay, and do I have a volunteer for op? Well, I, I can try. Okay, let's go there then. So let's start with our prop argument. Okay, so if we give salaries to stay at home parents, stay at home parents, it's going to help them, uh, help encourage them uh, to take care of their kids and actually to have kids in the first place. And why is it important for them, first of all, to not be stressed and scared of getting, of having babies and to actually do that mm -hmm. simply because we don't want populations to die out. We want populations to be there. So, um, having kids that are healthy and uh, well raised because their parents had time to be there with them without being stressed and overworked is important in producing more working and functional adults that's number one plus also uh, it will save the effort on accepting immigrants uh, and trying and forcing them into blending into the culture of the new country simply because we have more older people than younger people and therefore we do need to encourage people to have their own kids Okay, very good. Let's get the op. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I think uh, such a measure uh, creates a large temptation not to work in uh, usual in normal or normal enterprises in school uh, in case you are a teacher uh, and uh, creates perverse incentive to sit at home and or uh, regretfully for the gap side, it doesn't create an incentive to take care of your children. So three reasons why. Uh, firstly, because uh, this work is much easier than to uh, teach many kids, for example, not only your one kid. And uh, for, for example, it's much easier than to work on the enterprises and uh, all that stuff. Uh, secondly, uh you uh, your time becomes more flexible so it's up to you uh you are more responsible for yourself compared to regime uh on enterprises when uh you are supposed to be at home at 8 uh, a.m for example and uh, go to your home at uh, 7 p.m and uh, uh all the stuff uh, thirdly perhaps it gives you negative emotions when uh, you face your own kids and not your boss. But uh, what impacts it causes? Why it's so bad uh, as uh, we think? Uh, firstly, we can product less because we have uh, less workers involved uh, in industries with some uh, material products for, for, or not material. For example, we have uh, less teachers and we have uh, less educational services. Uh, because of that, yes. Yeah? So, and we have uh, less educated people uh, who uh, can take res responsibility of our society in future, become scientists, for example, become CEO, businessmen, or uh, other teachers, and uh, all, all that stuff. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, price on labor is uh, much more expensive on the GAF side because we have uh, less. Uh, workers, it means that uh, labor is more expensive and not every enterprise can pay for that. And we understand in case when uh, labor 
uh, is much more expensive, pro products uh, and services uh, became uh, more uh, expensive for consumers as well. But thirdly, we have uh, less, less taxpayers uh, and uh, uh, even salaries for these stay-at-home parents will not be uh, so big uh, just because uh, we have less taxpayers who can pay for uh, this uh, over-expensive uh, labor. So in terms of weighing, I have uh, several weights. Uh, firstly, it's the certainty of impact uh, opening governments brings us because know that we don't pay uh, this salary uh, for taking care of your, of your children and to the, to, to the quality of taking care for them. Uh, so uh, what do you teach uh, your children? How do you behave? Uh, towards them and uh, all that stuff, uh, we just give you salary uh, for uh, sitting at home and for having children, but we don't know what happens there, so it makes uh, the impacts not so plausible, but on our side we for sure uh, create this perverse incentives to uh, lose your normal job and just sit at home uh, with your kids. Uh, secondly, we think uh, we, uh, we are better according to the criteria of prevalence of our impact, according to the criteria of scale, uh, because uh, having uh, a health and developed economy, it's beneficial for everybody, for it's beneficial for kids who don't have their own kids, uh, it's be beneficial for child-free persons, and it's beneficial for everybody, uh, not only for people uh, who, who are parents, yes? Uh, and thirdly, we th think uh, we can give some uh, so social uh, allowances for migrants and to s those critical uh, cases of vulnerable people uh, opening government gives us, uh, but we don't have alternatives to creating health economy uh, uh, we need a workforce, we need to have large workforce uh, to develop it. Okay, very good. Uh, Prop, do you want to come back and offer some way? There was a lot in there, so don't feel like you need to weigh against all of it. Just pick one, one or two things. Uh, I think I'll just say a general thing. Um, Basically, how I see this, I see that the money spent by the government on, uh, first of all, mentally and help, like from the health and mental side, treating kids or adults or teens that are suffering from the idea that no one took care of them when they were younger, when they were just left there. I think the money spent on taking care of them and actually bringing them back to normal is way much more than all of what he just said. Plus also the money spent on uh, immigrants and help it, helping them to blend in or helping them dealing with the consequences of having different people come in and all of these things is way much more than all of what you have just said. Okay, very good. So weighing on the basis of uh, scope and cost. Yes, question. Uh, say it about case of opposition. They say the statement that people will lose their normal job because now they have money. Uh, uh, for me, hard to complain with government case because I already have problem to remember. But most important, what that we must say, it show how many people is working just to survive, and. Uh, how they will don't want to use in future work in future just because they have a new type of money which helps them to, to live and survive yeah so a key part of this debate would be it would rely a bit on things like the model given by, by government to sort of work out well how feasible is this how feasible is it to have a child uh, to stay at home looking after them and live off that money. Will that actually be more than you get for a proper job? Um, if it isn't, well, how much is enough? So there's probably lots to say, but I think that's a reasonable off argument that this might incentivize people to not work or even if it's not as extreme as, and this is a general piece of debating advice, it's always a good way, good idea to make your arguments with the more extreme version of the impact as well as the less extreme version of the impact 
And that way, judges are probably going to buy one of them, even if they don't think people will suddenly start quitting their jobs and having babies to get this money. They might believe that probably what this does is it just means that there's less incentive to go back to work. So, for example, what's very common is that people have a child. They take a couple of years off, maybe, whilst the baby is very young. Once it gets to sort of school age, they start going back to work because they don't need to be at home all the time. Maybe nowadays, if with this policy, what happens is people just don't go back to work. And so even if we're not saying loads of people are going to suddenly quit work and have babies to take advantage of this policy, the people who are already having children are just less likely to go back to work. So we do still get a decrease in the number of people working. It's just not as extreme. And that's a decent way to, uh, to, to make arguments. Have basically the same logic, the two different impacts at two different levels. The quite extreme level and then the less extreme level. And that way judges will say, you know, they gave us the big scary harm, but they also gave us the reasonable harm. And then sometimes other teams get excited and they only rebut that big harm. Like, no one is going to quit their job just to have a baby. Babies are loads of hassle and blah, 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 blah. And they forget about the other impact you gave, which was the more reasonable one. Yes, there was a hand. Yeah, I want to ask a question, please. So while arguing for a proposition, can you propose a policy that, for example, uh, we will pay salary only for like the first three years of um, for a person like um, until his child is three years old. Can we propose a policy or just useless? Uh, yeah, you absolutely could. This is a believes motion, so you don't have to give a 100% ironclad policy. But I think you could say, yeah, we think that the state should pay salaries for uh, parents who stay at home uh, when their children are, you know, between the ages of zero and three, sure, if you want to, mm -hmm. yeah. I would probably, if you're going to do that route, I would say zero to three seems a bit odd. I would go, well, I guess it depends what age they go to school in your country, but in most countries it's sort of like four or five. So yeah. I would just say until school age, um, then yeah, absolutely. We, we pay a salary to keep them home whilst before the kid can go to school. Um, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. So that would, would it be like a rebuttal for that point um, that opposition said that people would just not uh, ever want to go back to work? Yes, that, that, would, that would stop up from making that argument. However, uh -huh. you would have to do this in the prime minister's speech. You couldn't uh -huh. in deputy be like, oh, well, actually, we'll only give it for the first five years after opposition have said that argument. You can't change your model later in the debate. But you could think in prep time, for example, you could think, what are the big op arguments? Uh, they might say that people will try and use this to like leave the workforce for a very long time. So we should limit it in our model. Let's say you can only get this for, you know, the first five years of your child's life, for example. Uh -huh. So that means closing tables cannot make that argument. No, closing can't come in and, and change the, the model. Uh huh. Okay, I understood. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. So I think we'll probably call it a day there because we are about the end. Um, unless anyone really wants to present some more arguments on this motion. No, in which case. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. The video will be uploaded along with the PowerPoint uh, somewhere on the internet, so you'll be able to get that in the future. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Yes, question. Uh, oh, it already said about PowerPoint. Interested to watch presentation again? Yes, yes so, so I'll put the PowerPoint. I'll give the PowerPoint to Artem and he will put it somewhere where you can all get it. Okay, thank you very much. All right, in which case, thank you everyone. Uh, it's an hour break now and then it's uh, on to the 
final workshops of the day later. I hope you found this one useful and I hope you find the next ones useful as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.